In this video we're going to take a look at some of the web challenges from the Digital Overdose 2021 CTF and we'll start off with the easiest challenge which is called Not Required. The description says, Hello, I'm Cheems Lover Boy 33 I made a PHP website, can you do a quick security check on it? So we've got this site already to connect to, let's open it up. And we go through to the site, we see hello, and we've basically got the same message there. Um, we can see here it's actually loading the file index.html. We could have a look at the source here just to see if there's anything hidden, any comments or anything. But it doesn't look like it. So uh, this is loading index.html. The first thing I would try to do here is see if we can access, well let's try just flags first of all. And we get this message saying uh, require flag, fail to open stream, no such directory. So this is a classic local file inclusion vulnerability. So they're including a file and they're allowing the user to supply the name of that file. So if we were to go and say move back a directory and try and open flag, then you can see it's actually trying, it's going to keep going back a directory each time we do that. In fact, what we can do here as well, let's go ahead and let me just try etc password. All right, yeah, so even without the moving through the directories, we're able to just include etc password there. Um, it doesn't give us any hint as to what the flag might be. So we could go around and keep trying to kind of look for the flag um, in flag related file names. What I did here was to uh, have a look at some filter tricks. Let me look for LFI filter cheat sheet. And I think hack tricks is down at the moment. Let me open high on coffee. Yeah, it's down at the moment, so we'll not be able to use that during this video. But if we go and have a look at the uh, high on coffee cheat sheet here, we'll see that there's some different wrappers that we can use to actually try to load PHP code. And in this case, we're likely to want to see what's inside this index.php file. Um, so let's see what we can do here. We have the PHP input we have this PHP filter. Let me try and include this. So I'm going to take a copy of that. We'll say the file is equal to this. So it's going to try to convert it into base64 and in that and then we'll be able to base64 decode the index.php hopefully to get the originating source code. So yep we've got a base64 encoded value which looks good. Let's go ahead and do echo uh, base64-d, we get our source code here and you can see that there's a, a note left in the PHP file saying delete bin secrets.txt. So now we've got a location of a file called secrets.txt. We can go ahead and just include this using our LFI vulnerability. We do that and we get back our flag. The next challenge is called git commit-m whatever and we don't have a description, we've just got this site to connect to. So let's open it up and take a look. We open that up and we'll see a message saying, if only you could see the source code with what looks like some kind of base64 encoded string. So I'm going to take a copy of that. Let's view the source just to see if there's any comments or anything in there, which there isn't. And let's go and try and base64 decode this so we can echo it again. Get rid of that space. And base64-d. And we don't get anything recognizable here, so we'll move on. We know that the description of the challenge says uh, well, it's related to a git uh, message. So let's try and just see if we can load .git. Oh. And we get forbidden. You don't have access uh, permission to access this resource. So we could go and make sure that's not just a generic message we get. And if we try and put in a different a typo here, you'll see we get not found. So the git repo is found. We just don't have permission to access it. So we might want to try and just just try it out anyway, see if we can clone the repo, which we can't, it's not found. We can go and have a look to see if we can access the config here. Let's do config, which we can, we can get the config. So if we can go through, we could we could brute force this basically with a with GoBuster or your directory busting tool of choice, FF or something like that. Um, let's see if we can have a look at, so let's do logs, refs, heads, master. And you can see here we have this commit, uh, initial commit, committed security suicide, and we can see that it was committed by Elliot, Mac user. Um, so what we're going to do here is go and have a look at a tool called git dumper, which we should be able to use to dump the repo. And I guess this is going to work a little bit, uh, pretty much the same as if we were to 
um, be brute force in the directories, but it knows what to look for in terms of the directory structure and typical um, file names or commit names, stuff like that. Um, so let's uh, install this. We can just do pip install. So I'm going to do pip install git dumper. And then to run it, we just need to run git dumper, our options, and then the URL and the directory. So let's um, create a new directory and we'll do git dumper and grab the URL, which I've closed down. Paste that in. We'll do dot git. I'm not sure if it's required, but uh, provide that and then the new directory as well. We run that and you can see, yeah, it's fetching all these objects. Um, we have our whole git directory there. Let's go and take a look at it. And let me jump into the git first of all. So we can actually see the full structure here. We could have a look with tree and see what's in each of these directories. We could try and grep for things. So we might want to grep for, let's do recursive, um, not case sensitive, and we could try and grep for flag in here. Nothing. Why don't we try and grep for curly brace? case it's found in these binary files but that's not too good let's do do for digital overflow and we're not getting anything so if we go back we could go and start having a look through some of these but um, if you go back we'll actually see that the git repo already has some stuff in it here so for example we have our index.php file so why don't we take a look at index.php and try and find out what's inside it because obviously we're not able to view the source code through the website itself and if we do that we'll see that we've got a decrypt function let me zoom in a bit. Oh, too much. We have an encrypt function and a decrypt function. Uh, create encryption key. And we can basically see that the index.php files, whenever we're opening up this website, what it's actually doing is it's using this private key. It's grabbing the file contents of flag, so it's loading the flag. And then it's going to encrypt the flag with this private key. And then it's going to echo that out. So what we actually have here is our flag, which has been encrypted. So why don't we go and just modify this code. Let's say that our flag, we're not loading it from a file, it's this right here. It's that, it's that um, value that we've just grabbed. And we've already got our private key. So why don't we just try and change this to decrypt. And we're decrypting the flag with the private key. That looks pretty good to me. But I'm missing a semicolon. And then it's just going to echo this out. Which again looks good. Let's try and run php index.php we get a message saying call to undefined functions so let's go and google that and see what it's about not enabled by default um, please refer to this for installation or we can do this so sudo apt get install mb string um, what I'm gonna do probably using a different PHP version so let me do PHP dash dash version we're using 7.4 so we'll do sudo apt get install PHP 7.4 and then let's paste in that MB string it's gonna run through that and install it and let's try and run PHP index.php again and this time we get back our flag so it's decrypted the flag using that encrypted flag value and the private key and it's returned our result. The next challenge is called Madlib and the description says I just created the first draft of my first Flask project a Madlib generator that fills the given words into a Madlib template try it out and let me know what you think the character length limit should make this app pretty secure so we've got this server and port number to connect to we're going to open that up and we'll see that we've got this form asking us to pick our words. Let's just try and put in some values here and see how it responds to different data types. Um, we might want to try and insert a script as well. And if we submit that, we'll get a message saying that it must not be longer than 21 characters. Let's take out our script and just put something else in here. We submit that and then this all comes back with our values been inserted into the string. Uh, we could have a look at the source here, the HTML, but there's really not too much for us to look at and we've been given the source code for the server side. So let's actually just open that up and take a look. I'm going to copy this over to Codium. 
And let's just step through the source code a bit before we look into the vulnerability. So we can see here that it's importing from Flask. We've got Flask render template string request and send from directory. If the website is loaded on the home page here, it's going to just call send from directory and send us the index.html rendered as HTML. But if we make a post request to Madlib, then it's going to check to make sure that the request.json is five. So it's going to make sure that we've inserted five JSON objects here. Uh, it's calling request json.get on each one of those, which we just saw it do. It's going to then make sure that the length of each one of these values that we've entered is less than 21 characters, 21 characters or less. And if it is, it's going to basically take each of the values that we've put in and it's going to put them into these curly braces here in the text. And then it's going to call render template string with the madlib. Um, if we try and insert more than five words, you can see it's going to come back and say the madlib only takes five words. So let's actually just jump over to burp suite. We'll see this post request that we made to madlib. I'm going to send that to the repeater. And if we then try and insert another one here, let's try and put in here uh, hacked, and then we'll say that's equal to I don't know, just something else. Send that off, and then this time we get the Madlib only takes five words. So that's basically what it was talking about in that case. So um, I'm going to open up, let's search here for SSTI server side template injection. And this is a really great article by James Kettle. Um, going through server-side template injection. Let's just jump through. I'm going to open up a cheat sheet as well. I normally go to hat tricks. It's down at the moment, but this is a really good cheat sheet as well, just for going through and trying to find some commands to throw at um, the site. So I would really recommend going through this whole article, but let me just cover a little bit of it. Template engines are widely used by web applications to present dynamic data via web pages and emails. On safely embedding user input in templates enables server-side template injection, a frequently critical vulnerability that's easy to mistake for cross-site scripting or miss entirely. Unlike cross-site scripting, template injection can be used to directly attack web servers' internals and often obtain RCE, remote code execution, turning every vulnerable application into a potential pivot point. Template injection can arise both through developer error and through intentional exposure of templates in an attempt to offer rich functionality, as is commonly done by wikis, blogs, etc. Internal template injection is such a common use case that many template engines offer a sandboxed mode for this expressed purpose. This paper defines a methodology for detecting and exploiting template injection and shows it being applied to craft RCE zero days for two widely deployed enterprise web applications. Generic exploits are demonstrated for five of the most popular template engines, including escapes from sandboxes whose entire purpose is to handle user-supplied templates in a safe way. Um, so it has some links to the web up to the talk that was done at Black Hat USA, as well as the white paper. And then we can basically go to this in introduction. It goes through some different templating engines, how to identify what template an engine is used. So for example, we have um, an example here. Let's go and throw this into our web application and you'll see that it's come back with 49 so it's actually interpreted this and what we can do is if we add some quotes here and submit that the fact that we've got back 777 uh, we've got back seven sevens shows that this is ginger 2 um, as the template in engine so if that would have come back with 49 I think it would have been maybe twig or something like that but you can basically go through some cheat sheets throw in some different commands in here and try and find out what it comes back with and from there identify what the template and engine is. In some cases maybe you'll get an error which will just kind of spit out the, the template engine that's used. And you see there we've tried to enter in self. Let's try and do self.dict and submit that. And this time we'll, we'll be able to dump out this full dictionary of keys and values. So let's take a copy of this. Where does it end? It ends right here. We'll take a copy of that. We'll go and try and make this a bit easier to read so we can format this in a better JSON format. And we can basically go and have a look through some of the functions we might be able to access here. So for example, we have Lipsum in there. That's going to be no use at all to us. We have this URL for. We can access the config and potentially set things in the config as well. Let's go back here and just change this to config dot items 
and submit that and we get these back as well so we could go and add these to our JSON viewer if we want to go and have a look through some of that but the problem we're going to run into trying to build this up essentially if we go back over to our cheat sheet here and look at some of the examples that we might be trying to run through you see a lot of these commands that we'd be trying to enter are far too long we have a maximum of 21 characters per command so we're not going to be able to enter anything like this and in fact even trying to access things like this the class base subclasses is going to be too long for us so my team had some good ideas on how to approach this and in the end found an unintended solution which I think seems to be easier than the intended solution so let's run through some of the thinking um, one of the first things which um, I thought was a really good idea was to use the request URL to try and extend the amount of space we have available here so for example if we were to pass in a request here and let's say this is longer than uh, 21 chars so we see we're actually passing this in in the request and if we now say that we want to print out the request.url let's try and print that we print that out and we get this full uh, URL here but if we just wanted to access the string that was at the end of that we can basically go and find out how long is this part of the string or this part of the string and access the substring of it so we can say here now let's go back and change this to set so we can actually set this to let's say a equals request URL and then in the next parameter we can use that variable which has just been set so we can say that we want to access say a and 34 onwards which is the size of the beginning of the URL and if we submit that uh, this time we don't get anything because we need our two curly braces on each side some of this again this time we get this is longer than 21 chars so we're actually able to pass in the problem is this is a string so if we try to pass in something here as in the uh, payloads that we were seeing over here if we were trying to pass in for example uh, one of these strings here and then try to execute it it'll actually be, it'll still be a string inside this value um, but we did have some things available to us here in the config we had uh, not in the config sorry in the self dot dict we had some things available including I can't see it now but where's cycler okay cycler we've got cycler and we've got joiner and let me actually just go SSTI going to go and open up another cheat sheet here jump down here to the you see here that if we were able to access a payload like this cycler.init.globals.os.popen then we'd be able to get some kind of command execution so for example let's go back and try and set this to let's try and use the cycler so if we say here that we want to use a is equal to cycler and then we could say in our second value here we want to set b is equal to a dot init let's go here and and the idea I think is to basically chain this together you can see here we've got our cycler init the idea would be to chain this together so say if we continue with this process and try and say let me actually just take a copy of that and then do the same our next bit was globals and then OS so we go here and say globals but we're going to run into the problem there that this is greater than 21 characters so I was trying to set this let's say instead that that's just B is equal to globals and then in the next value we can say that say C is equal to A dot B and then maybe OS and then you would like to hope towards the end we would be able to just say now that we want to access C dot P open and then say ls 
Let's try and run that. Encountered an error. Dot read. Now it's greater than 21 characters, so we could try and add our p open here maybe, and then just say c dot or c ls. Uh, okay, now this is greater than 21 characters. So this was kind of the process of going through and trying to use variables to solve this. To be honest, at this point I hadn't really contributed too much towards solving the challenge, this is mostly my teammates working on it. But what I was thinking here is, um, could we bypass this length check in any way? So this is checking is the length of each one of these values greater than 21. And if we're passing in a string, obviously it's going to check is there more than 21 characters. But what happens if we pass a list here instead? So if I was to go back here and say, um, Let's let's go and take a copy, for example, of this right here, which is something like what we want to execute. So if we send that off, this is obviously greater than 21 characters. But if we were to send this off and make sure that this was inside a some square brackets, it's now a list. So what's the length of this now? The length would be one because there's only one item in the list. Now we're still getting an error there, but let's take out some of these other commands which might be causing some issues and we submit that again and this time you'll see that in the place of our verb we've actually got back our ID so we can go back and say let's run ls and that comes back with the list of the files in the directory we can go ahead and say cat flag.txt and then we get back our flag so this was the unintended solution. We didn't actually make use of the five different placeholders we have here. The intended solution, I believe, was to actually use the config. To, and I think you can actually see, if we go back to our um, stack viewer here, you can actually see that somebody else has uh, assigned some variables. So you can see that they've assigned OS to be D. They've assigned Popen to be E. And they're using the URLs and stuff as well. They've got init, they've got globals. So the idea really is to build these up in the config so that they persist between each request and then you can call those from there but um, it looks like the solution that we used there was uh, quite a bit easier anyway but I look forward to seeing what kind of creative solutions some other people have come up with for this as well. Okay I know I said we were just going to focus on the web challenges in this week's video but uh, these hash cracking challenges are nice and easy let's just run through a few of them. So we've got some hashes to crack. Our first one, let's run hash ID to get an idea what type of hash it is. Most likely MD2 or MD5 according to this. But we can take a copy of this. We can go to a couple of different sites. Let's actually, we'll try out CrackStation. Generally a good one, but I find that it's probably going to ask us to do a capture. Oh, it didn't? Okay, awesome. Uh, we run that, we get our first um, flag back, which is Phantom Lover. Let's go and have a look at the next one. Again, hopefully we can just paste this in here. Leave that to crack. We didn't even run hash ID that time, but let's do it. And this time, SHA1. You can actually see it comes up here, SHA1. This was fish and chips, fish chips. And let's go back to the third one. We can run hash ID. And this time, SHA512 by the looks of it. Again, let's just go and throw it in the crack station crack hashes, this time Mama Dobbins. Let's go back to our fourth hash. Hash ID. This time most likely Snefru256 or Sha256, which sounds more likely to me, but let's go and throw it in the crack station, see if it knows what to do with it. Okay, now it's now it wants me to start doing some image labeling. Crack hash. This time we get not found. Okay. So what I'm going to do this time is let's create a file called hash. Let's paste that in there and I'm going to run this with John. So we can use John the Ripper. We'll do John dash dash word list. What I really don't like here is if I put in equals, it's not going to allow me to do our, it's not going to allow me to do auto complete. So I have to put in like a space here. Do user share word list. Hopefully it'll be in rock U. We'll pass in hash as well. Let me go and get rid of the space. And it's going to try and identify what type of hash it is. And it's come back very quickly to say that the hash was happy family. So it detected hash type ghost. I guess that's what it was using. Yeah, it used, it used ghost. But you have the option of specifying some of these others if you want to try those instead. 
and now it's we've got the hash but we could run john dash dash show hash as well to get access to that again uh, so that one was happy family let's go and have a look at the fifth one okay so this time we'll check the hash id again we've got some dollar signs in there which we need to escape so let me go and do that and this time we've got blowfish okay um, what I'm going to do now is move over to Hashcat because Hashcat's a lot quicker, um, particularly if I do it outside of the VM. I'm going to go and have a look here. Hashcat example hashes. And this is just a good place to go and find out what kind of mode we need to use here. So in this case, it was Blowfish, which we can see here is mode 3200. So bearing that in mind, let me jump over to my window system, to my outside my VM, and let's go and try this in Hashcat. So I'm over on the Windows system here, I've got the command prompt open and I've got the hashes in a file called hashes.txt hashes so you can see here that's the hash but we could just pass this in as a string as well and now we're going to run hashcat.exe and we'll pass in that mode which was 3200 for blowfish and then we'll pass in the hashes so I should just type that in hashes, hashes.txt. We can also pass in the word list here as well. So I've got a few word lists here. We've got crackstation, we've got have I been pwned, we've got rock you, which we'll try rock you first of all. Um, okay, let me take out that W. It was the wrong thing to put in. And um, we'll run through that. We can enter any key for status here. So that'll give you an idea how long it's got to complete. You can see here, started one second. It's got six hours to complete, seven hours to complete. And we can see that that's finished. It started at 53 minutes past. It took less than two minutes to complete. And we got back our password, which was Cowabunga. So back over to our challenges. Let's go and have a look at the sixth hash. And this time we have this very rand salt thing here. Let's um, take a copy of this. Again, let's use hash ID. Let's set this to backslash so that we can identify it. MD5 crypt, okay, let's go to our hashcat here, let's search for MD5 crypt and we'll see that it's mode 500. So I'm going to jump back over to the Windows system and let's try it out. Okay, so we're back over on the Windows system, we can have a look at the hashes again. This has been updated with the new hash and we want to run then hashcat.exe and this time the mode is 500 for MD5 crypt and we're passing in the hashes and then we'll use the word list again rock you. Once through that we can hit S for status that one cracked very quickly it took five seconds and it found that the password was Scotty Banks. Okay and back over to the VM for the final challenge which is hash 7 and this is quite a long one let's have a look at the hash ID again get rid of all these dollar signs and there's only one possibility it's a SHA-512 crypt so let's go and have a look at SHA-512 oh. let's see if we can just put in crypt, yep it's 1800 alright let's jump over to the Windows system and try it out and once again we can check the hashes see that we've got our updated hash in here and we want to run hashcat.exe the mode is 1800, the hashes are in hashes, hashes.txt, and the word list again will just be word list rock you. Again we can hit status, but before we can even hit status it's cracked. Um, it started at 23, finished at 26, so it took 3 seconds and identified that the hash was I get money. And that wraps it up for the hash cracking challenges. So I did solve a couple of other challenges in the CTF and I'm going to go and take a look at some more now as well. But I want to try and limit these videos in terms of the amount of categories I'm running through in the walkthroughs just because it's quite time consuming going through and editing out all the audio issues and zooming in on text and things like that. And I want to try and focus more on just kind of working on some of the challenges as well. But um, shout out to the team anyway and I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, any interesting solutions to any of the challenges that I
demonstrated here or any of the challenges that I missed, then do let me know.